Nisha classes. In this video, we are going to cover RTP questions with respect to accounting standards of group 1. So, let us see one by one the questions of accounting standards which are there in RTP issued by institute for C enter May 22 attempt. Here the question number 15 which you can see. Summarized balance sheet of Claude Trader as on 31st March 2020 is given below. Dear students, this is a similar question or I can say exact question which is there in JKC textbook AS1 Disclosure of Accounting Policy question number 5. Exact similar question in terms of amounts also that is figures also all are same. So let us see this question once again here. The balance sheet is given of Claude Trader. This balance sheet is in T format. This balance sheet is not of a company. You can see here it is a proprietor's capital which is mentioned rupees 3 lakh. It means it is a sole trader's balance sheet. Profit and loss account, 10% loan account, trade payable. On the asset side, fixed assets, closing stock, trade receivable, deferred expenses and cash and bank. Additional information is as follows. Looking at the question, it is little bit lengthy. So, let us first of all read the requirement part and then we can read the question accordingly. You are required to prepare not assuming going concern. Dear students, they are saying not assuming going concern. If you are aware, going concern is nothing but the fundamental accounting assumption. There are three fundamental accounting assumption. That is nothing but CAG, CAC, consistency, accrual and going concern. So, a specific disclosure is not required if we are following fundamental accounting assumption. But if fundamental accounting assumptions are not followed, not assumed, then the specific disclosure is required. Now, in case of going concern is not valid. If going concern is not valid or if we are not following going concern assumption, in that case, as you all are aware that we are supposed to prepare our financial statement on NRV basis. That is assets on net realizable value and on liability side, you are supposed to show your liabilities on net settlement value basis. Now, you are required to prepare profit and loss account for the year 2020-21 and balance sheet is on 31st March 2021. Now, you might be thinking, sir, balance sheet is already given in the question. Dear students, that balance sheet, if you can see, the date is mentioned as on 31st March 2020. It means this is of 2019-20 or you can say this is nothing but the previous year or you can also say this balance sheet is nothing but the opening balance sheet. Now, what you are supposed to prepare? So, you are supposed to prepare financial statement or I can say final accounts for the year 2021 and you are supposed to prepare the balance sheet as on 31st March 21 that is closing balance sheet for this question. Now, let us read the additional information accordingly. First one. The remaining life of fixed asset is 8 years and the pattern of use of the asset is even. Now, the remaining life of the asset is 8 years. Now, you can see here in the opening balance sheet, the book value of the fixed asset which is mentioned is 360. Now, if you depreciate this fixed asset based on this remaining useful life of 8 years, I am repeating once again. I am repeating once again, if you depreciate this fixed asset based on remaining useful life of 8 years, then sir, what will be the amount of depreciation, then the depreciation amount will be 45,000. But dear students, you are not supposed to depreciate this fixed asset based on the useful life because, because here, going concern assumption is not valid. If going concern assumption is not valid, then we are supposed to show our assets in our balance sheet at net realizable value. As if like we are about to close our business, we are selling our business. So, we are supposed to inform to our stakeholders that boss see our balance sheet and these are the assets where the net realizable value of the fixed asset which is mentioned is 3,25,000. It means if we are closing our business, we will get only 3,25,000 from the realizable value of the fixed asset. So, we are supposed to prepare our financial statement on NRV basis only. So, here, if you can see in the opening balance sheet, fixed assets are appearing at 360. In the closing balance sheet, you are not supposed to charge a depreciation based on the estimated useful life. Here, we are supposed to show our fixed asset at NRV only since going concern assumption is not valid. So, dear students, 360,000 is in the opening balance sheet. In the closing balance sheet, we have to show at 3,25,000 how much amount of depreciation we are charging. 
So, sir, we are charging depreciation of 35,000 rupees. You can also see the solution. Here in the solution, directly in the balance sheet, they have mentioned fixed asset of 3,25,000 and depreciation of 35,000. Now, definitely here in your solution, in bracket, you have to mention this is a mandatory requirement when going concern assumption is not valid. As we already discussed that if the fundamental accounting assumptions are not valid, if it is not assumed, then we have to give a specific disclosure that we are not following or I can say these fundamental accounting assumptions are not valid. So, a specific disclosure is required and here in p &L statement and balance sheet, you have to mention in the bracket as it is mentioned here. Okay, let us move to the second adjustment or I can say second additional information. Purchases and sales in 2020-21 amounted to 22,50 and 27,50. Now you might be thinking sir why we are not preparing trading account. If you want to prepare trading account you can separately prepare but here in the requirement part they have just mentioned profit and loss account and balance sheet. So we will prepare a combined trading and profit and loss account. We will name as profit and loss account only but we will just prepare a combined trading and profit and loss account so this purchase and sales will go in our combined trading and PL only purchase will go on the debit side and sales will go on the credit side so you can see your purchase is 22 lakh 50 and your sales 27 lakh 50 now the next question will come in your mind so what will be the second effect of this purchases and sales because let us say example if there is a cash purchase the entry would be purchase account debit to cash or a bank account if it is a cash sales then entry for the same will be cash or bank account debit to sales account now sir are we supposed to give the second effect now listen carefully here in the opening balance sheet this is nothing but the opening balance sheet in opening balance sheet cash and bank balance is 25,000 which is mentioned now they have they have already given you the closing balance or i can say they have already calculated the closing balance of cash and bank balance so you can see in point number eight cash balance as on 31st march 2021 is 4,22. so dear students this 422 is already given it means it is after adjusting the cash purchases and cash sales now the next question will also come sir what if these purchases are on credit basis what if these sales are on credit basis then definitely if it is a credit purchase then it is already adjusted in the creditors and the creditors closing balance is also given. You can see in point number 7 they have given the closing trade payable. Closing trade payable means closing creditors balance it means it will be after adjusting the purchases made during the year if it was on a credit basis. Similarly for sales if it was a credit sales then here they have given the closing trade receivable balances. So, here in the opening balance sheet, they have given the opening balances of trade receivable and payable, but they have already calculated the closing balance which is given in the question. So, we are not supposed to give the second effect for this purchases and sales. If it was on a cash basis, then closing cash bank balance is already given. If it was on a credit basis, then Closing trade payable balances and trade receivable balances are given. Okay, sir. So, we will not go for the second effect as it is already adjusted in the debtors, creditors or I can say cash bank balances. Okay. So, let us go for the third one. Cost and the net realizable value of the stock on 31st March 2021 were 2 lakh and 2,50,000 respectively. Dear students, as per AS2, valuation of inventory, inventories are supposed to be valued at lower of cost or NRV. So, if going concern assumption is still valid, if fundamental accounting assumptions are still followed, then we will go for a normal valuation of inventory based on AS2 and we would have considered the closing inventory at 2 lakh, that is nothing but the lower than the NRV. But here we are supposed to show to our stakeholders, shareholders that boss we are closing our business. What if we are going to sell our inventory right now today then how much we will get that we are supposed to show to our stakeholders that is nothing but the NRV of 2,50,000. So here instead of going for lower of cost or NRV we will definitely go for only NRV that is nothing but the net realizable value of 2,50,000. This is nothing but the closing stock. 
because it is mentioned on 31st March 2021. So, being closing stock, we will write on profit and loss account credit side as well as balance sheet asset side. You can see here they have mentioned closing stock as well as on the balance sheet asset side, it is mentioned as a closing stock. Now, you might be worried, sir, uh, what about this closing stock which is given in the question? What is this 1,50,000 dear students? This will be considered as opening stock for the current financial year. So, you can see here on the debit side of combined trading in PNL or I can say you can say profit and loss account, they have mentioned here opening stock of 1,50,000. Okay, let us move ahead. Fourth one, expenses for the year amounted to 78,000. Now, the only difference between JKSC question number 5 of AS1 and this RTP question is this portion that is which includes interest on 10% loan amount for the year. This was not mentioned in the JKSC question. Now, here in RTP, they have specifically mentioned this additional line. Now, what do you mean by that? Let us understand. First of all, Expenses for the year amounted to 78,000. So, expenses we will debit our PL and uh, these expenses are generally paid because they have not mentioned anything with respect to outstanding expenses. So, we will assume or we will consider that these expenses are paid. If it is paid, it is already adjusted in the cash and bank balances, and cash and bank balances after adjustment that is closing balance is mentioned here 422. So, no need to give the second effect, only one effect will come, that is nothing but the expenses of 78,000. Now, here they are saying, which includes interest on 10% loan amount for the year. If you see in the balance sheet, if you look at the balance sheet, in balance sheet, there is one item, 10% loan account, 2,10,000. 10% loan account, that is nothing but 2,10,000. Now, on this 2,10,000, ideally, there should be interest on loan because this 2 lakh 10,000 is it is coming in the opening balance sheet so definitely we have to consider the interest component so how much will be the interest component 21,000 now here specifically they have added that this 10 percent loan interest is already included in the expenses of rupees 78,000 so it means it is also paid so interest on 10 percent loan is also not outstanding are you able to understand what I am trying to convey okay so sir we are not supposed to do anything with respect to this interest component. In JKC textbook, this uh, highlighted line was not there. So, there we are supposed to assume what we are supposed to consider. Whether we should consider that 10% loan interest is already included in this expenses or not. If it is already included, then no need to do anything because it is already paid. But what if we are considering that this 10% interest on loan is not included in this expenses of 78,000? Then we have to give sir two effect because we are considering that that particular interest is due but not paid. If that interest is due but not paid, then we have to give the two effect that is nothing but being an expense. It will go on your PL debit side and it is still outstanding. We are supposed to pay, we are yet to pay, so it will go on the balance sheet liability side as well. So, uh, according to the question which is there in JKC textbook, there we can consider two assumptions based on that your solution will vary you have to mention your note but here no need to assume anything because they have specifically mentioned that that interest on 10 percent loan is included in the total expenses of 78,000. okay let us move ahead next deferred expenses are amortized equally over five years now first of all tell me is this business is going to see next five years upcoming five years the answer is no are we going to run this business for next five years? The answer is no. Then there is no point in keeping this deferred expenses in your balance sheet on the asset side. So let us amortize this entire deferred expenses in the current year itself or I can say in this financial statement only. Another logic of writing of this deferred expenses entirely in the current year is, see, uh, we are preparing our financial statement on NRV basis. It means we are supposed to record our assets on net realizable value basis. Now tell me what is the net realizable value of this deferred expenses? Are we going to sell this deferred expenses? The answer is no. Boss, this is kind of a fictitious asset. We are not going to get any realizable value against this. And even we cannot sell these deferred expenses. So ideally, if I am talking about this deferred expenses, the NRV value, net realizable value is zero. 
If the net realizable value is 0, let us write off the entire amount to your PL only. So, we will put this entire deferred expenses in your PL that is nothing but entire amount of 50,000. Okay, let us move ahead. Point number 6 trade receivable. Interesting point, please pay attention. Trade receivables on 31st March 2021, that is nothing but they are talking about closing balance. So, obviously, logically, we are not supposed to bother about this opening balances because after doing all the adjustments, they have given the final closing balance which we are supposed to deal with. Now, trade receivables on 31st March 2021 are Rs. 1,50,000. Okay. Of which, Rupees 5000 is doubtful. Okay. Sir, we should create a provision because ideally if say, let us say example, we are closing our business right now. How much we are going to get? Sir, 1,50,000 minus 5000, that is 145, we are going to get. That is nothing but the realizable value. Definitely, we will get 145. 5000 is still doubtful. So, we are supposed to prepare our financial statement or we are supposed to tell to our stakeholders, boss, let us see our balance sheet. We are going to get 145 right now. But read further. Collection of another rupees 25,000 depends on successful reinstallation of certain products supplied to the customer. We have supplied certain products to the customer and now we are supposed to do the reinstallation of those products and then only we will get that 25,000 rupees from the customer. Now, let us say we are closing our business right now only. We are about to close our business. Definitely, we will not be able to reinstall those particular products to which we have supplied to the customer. So, definitely being on the conservatism side definitely i am saying that this 25000 is doubtful to recover that we will not get this 25000 because we are closing our business so right now right now if i am supposed to prepare our financial statement i am supposed to show to my stakeholders that if we are closing our business what is the realizable value of our debtor it means if we go and realize our debtors today how much we will get sir 150 minus 5,000 is doubtful and this 25,000 is also doubtful right now. So, total 30,000 is nothing but the doubtful. The total amount of a provision will be how much, sir? Then it will be 30,000. So, 150 minus 30,000, the realizable value is 120. So, here you can see in the solution, trade receivable less provision is 120 and here the provision for doubtful lets is 30,000. You might be thinking, sir, are we supposed to give any detailed calculation like in fixed asset? We will write inner column 360 less depreciation. It is fine because anyways you are preparing final accounts or financial statement of a sole trader. For sole trader, there is no specific format mentioned in any of the act or anywhere. So it is fine if you write directly in the outer column with the final figure also. Next. Next is nothing but the closing trade payable. You can see the seventh point. In the seventh point, they have mentioned, in the seventh point, they have mentioned closing trade payable are 75,000 likely to be settled at 10% discount. It means uh, our closing creditors are worth of rupees 75,000. But if we pay right now, that is nothing but the net settlement value right now, today. What if we pay today, then how much we are supposed to pay? So, 75,000 minus 10%, that is nothing but 67,500. 10% discount we are getting. So, in balance sheet, on the liability side, net settlement value for trade payable is 67500 whereas this uh, trade payable will go on your penal credit. That is nothing but the discount received from creditors. So, if you want to write the full entire statement that is by discount received from creditors or trade payable, you can definitely write. Next, cash balance. That is nothing but the closing cash balance, 422. It is already mentioned. Next, there is an early repayment penalty for the loan of 25,000. There is an early repayment. You might be thinking, sir, why there is a penalty for repaying early? See, this, this is the concept of, I can say, almost 15, 20 years before. Right now, this concept does not exist. Whenever you want to repay your loan, you can go in the bank and you can just give the payment. So, there is no concept of early repayment penalty right now. But earlier it was. How it works, please listen carefully. Let us say example, I am taking loan from Access Bank. I am taking loan from Access Bank. The loan amount is 1 lakh and the tenure is 5 years. So, I am taking loan of rupees 1 lakh for next 5 years from Access Bank. 
Now think from the point of view of Axis Bank. Don't you think so? Axis Bank is getting commitment with respect to interest income for next five years. That Axis Bank is thinking, okay, now for next five years on one lakh rupees, I am going to get interest income. And suddenly, if I go after one year only and say I want to repay the entire loan amount, don't you think so? They will lose that commitment of interest income which they consider for entire five years. So now you might be thinking, sir, then they will give that same amount of loan to someone else. It is not that easy to get the customer for the loan. You might be getting calls or I can say your parents might be getting calls for the loan from the bank that do you need loan or I can say are you in a need of funds. So basically bank search for the customer for lending their money. So it is not that easy to get the customer for lending the money. So let us say example I repaid the entire amount in one year only. Uh, and after that, bank took almost two to three months to search for some customer for lending their money. So, bank will be going to or bank is going to lose the interest for next two to three months. So, for that two to three months, the bank is going to lose interest. For that, bank will charge penalty from us. So, sir, that is nothing but the concept of early repayment penalty. Now, in our balance sheet, there is a 10% loan, 2,10,000. Now, if I am saying going concern assumption is not valid. Going concern assumption is not valid. If going concern assumption is not valid, then definitely we are preparing our financial statement on net realizable value basis or on the liability side, I am supposed to mention the net settlement value. It means what if today I am settling my liability, what will be the settlement value? So, 2,10,000 is not the settlement value. If I am being repaying this loan today, then the net settlement value will be 2,10,000 plus the early repayment penalty of 25,000, then it is total 2,35,000 which we have to pay. So definitely 25,000 loan penalty will go on your PL debit side and the net settlement value of 235, you are supposed to write on the balance sheet liability side. Now we are done with all the additional information. Let us see what is pending in your balance sheet. Fixed asset done on the asset side. This closing stock became opening stock trade receivable we already dealt with closing balances of trade receivable deferred expenses entirely amortized and cash and bank balance closing balance is already given now on the liability side proprietors capital of 3 lakh you can see in the solution it is mentioned proprietors capital of 3 lakh next profit and loss account of 1 lakh 25 boss this is nothing but the opening profit and loss opening profit and loss it is nothing but the opening profit and loss this either you can write in your PNL credit side here you can mention by balance brought down 125 then definitely your net profit will change but we will not go this way we will write in our balance sheet only in balance sheet PNL 125 is nothing but the opening balance and then current year this is nothing but the opening balance then current year net profit will come which will add here and we will write the total figure on outer column next sir after pnl 10 percent loan is done trade payable is done so all items are done from the question now here we will calculate the net profit that is 389500 we will add your 389500 total is 5 lakh 14500 and this balance sheet will tally at 11 lakh 17000 with this this question is over let us move to the next question Question number 16A, a company with a turnover of 225 crores, first of all they have mentioned a company, okay, and borrowings of 51 crore, during the year ended 31st March 2021, wants to avail, wants to avail the exemption available in adoption of accounting standards applicable to companies, okay, for the year ended 31st March 2021. Advise the management on the exemption that are available as per the company's rules 2021. Now listen carefully. Here they are talking about company, it means corporate. Now in case of applicability of accounting standards, we must have see the applicability for corporate as well as non-corporate. In case of non-corporate, there were level 1 entities, level 2 entities, level 3 entities. Then amendment also came for level 4 entities. So now there are 4 levels in non-corporate entities. 
so in non corporate entities level 1 entity level 2 entity level 3 entity level 4 entities and in case of corporate we just say that in case of corporate mca will decide the applicability that is nothing but the ministry of corporate affairs based on the company's accounting standard rules 2021 so in case of corporate in case of corporate the mca will decide the uh, applicability now here they are talking about corporate and not the non corporate entities i'm repeating once again in case of non corporate entities there was level 1 entity level 2 entity level 3 and level 4 applicability was mentioned now here they are talking about purely corporate entities in case of corporate entities there are two bifurcation or two division or i can say two classification for smcs and non smcs smcs that is nothing but small and medium size companies and non smcs that is non small and medium size companies so based on the type of a company whether it is smcs or non smcs exemptions are given in corporate entities only i am talking about now corporate non corporate we are not discussing right now because it is not required based on this question in case of corporate entities applicability will be decided by mca ministry of corporate affairs based on this company's rules 2021 now in case of corporate the classification is made smcs and non smcs for smc certain exemptions are available from accounting standard or i can say from applicability of accounting standards for non smcs there is no exemption there are no exemption all accounting standards are applicable now they have just mentioned here a company with a turnover of 225 crore and a borrowing of 51 crore so first of all we have to understand whether this company fall under the category of smc or non smc if it comes under non smc then exemption will not be available if it fall under the category of smcs then certain exemptions with respect to applicability of accounting standards are there are you able to understand this what i'm trying to convey okay now let us see what are the categories or i can say what are the criteria for considering that particular company as smcs so you can see your small and medium size company means whose equity or a debt securities are not listed or are not in the process of listing on any stock exchange whether in india or outside india first of all i will read this definition of smc and then i'll give you where we have seen such kind of definition in non corporate entity listen carefully so smc's definition is here second which is not a bank or a financial institution or an insurance company whose turnover does not exceed rupees 250 crore it means turnover should be less than or equal to 250 crore next borrowings borrowings should be less than or equal to 50 crore and which is not a holding or subsidiary company which is not a small and a medium sized company now if you remember if you remember in non corporate entity in non corporate entity level 1 entities level 1 entities to categorize as a level 1 non corporate entities they mentioned that the turnover should exceed 250 crore borrowing should exceed 50 crore then bank or a financial institutions or insurance agents then the entities is in already listed or i can say in process of listing holding or subsidiary entity of the above now exactly the negative definition is given here i'm repeating once again in case of non-corporate entities level one entity the definition was or i can say the criteria was sir the criteria was turnover should exceed 250 crore borrowing should be more than 50 crore then sir banks financial institutions or insurance agencies or insurance agents or insurance companies then the entities which are listed or in the process of listing and the last is nothing but the holding or subsidiary entities of any of the above now the exactly negative definition is given for smcs so in nutshell if i want to revise everything sir here we are going to talk about corporate we are going to talk about company in case of company the applicability will be decided by mc ministry of corporate affairs based on company's rule 2021 that is nothing but accounting standard rules now here there are two categories of companies smcs and non smcs for non smcs no exemption all a is applicable for smcs some or i can say few exemptions are available so they are asking whether this company is eligible to get certain exemption from applicability of accounting standard yes or no 
So first of all, we should know what do you mean by SMCs. So here the SMCs, the definition we already saw. Now in this case, you can see the turnover of 225 crore. 225 crore, it means it is less than or equal to 250 crore only. But if you can see the borrowing is 51 crore. Sir, it is not less than or equal to 50 crore. It means it does not fall under the category of SMCs. So sir, definitely this is nothing but non-SMCs. Is there any exemption for non-SMCs? The answer is no. So you can see here. It is not a small and medium sized company. The exemptions available to SMC are not available to this company. Next, 16B, very easy. An organization whose objects are charitable or religious believes that the accounting standards are not applicable to it since only a very small proportion of its activities are business in nature. The answer is no accounting standard will be applicable those organizations who are solely into charitable activity solely into charitable activity i am repeating once again solely into charitable activity then only accounting standards are not applicable if they are engaging themselves into any small proportion of the activity which is related to business or i can say commercial activity in that case accounting standard will be definitely applicable so here the answer is mentioned in the same way only so let us move to the next question that is nothing but 17a which is based on valuation of inventory. In determining the cost of inventories, it is appropriate to exclude certain cost. Definitely sir, we have to exclude certain cost. What are the cost which is included from the cost of inventory? Sir, first is nothing but the abnormal losses. Abnormal losses will be always passed on to the customer. No. Sir, abnormal loss, we cannot pass on to the customer. Normal loss will be passed on to the customer because normal loss is expected loss. That is bound to happen. That is due to inherent nature of the product only. So, definitely normal loss will be passed on to the customer. But abnormal loss, we cannot pass on to the customer. That is due to inefficiency of the businessman only. And that will definitely go to our PNL. So, it is appropriate to exclude certain costs. So, first is nothing but the abnormal losses. Second, so second is nothing but the storage cost. Once the goods are in saleable condition or I can say they reach to their location of sale or I can say place of sale, then after that any storage cost will not be added in the cost of inventory. So third is nothing but the administration cost and last is nothing but the selling and distribution cost. I am repeating once again. It is appropriate to exclude certain costs. First is nothing but the abnormal losses. Second is nothing but your storage cost. Next, administrative expenses and the last is nothing but the selling and distribution and recognize them as expenses in the period in which they are incurred. Correct. Provide example of such cost as per as to already I gave. Next, B. On the basis of information given below, find the value of inventory by periodic inventory method as per AS2 to be considered while preparing the balance sheet as on 31st March 2021 on weighted average basis. Okay, we are supposed to use weighted average basis. Details of purchases mentioned and details of issue of inventory. Net realizable value of inventory as on 31st March 2021 is 107.75 per unit. You are required to compute the value of inventory as per AS2. Okay. So, first of all, let us calculate the cost of inventory based on weighted average method. These are nothing but the valuation method. Valuation method, you have seen the inventories which are not ordinarily interchangeable and inventories which are ordinarily interchangeable. The inventories which are ordinarily interchangeable in that there are two valuation model FIFO or I can say weighted average method. We are supposed to follow your weighted average method. So let us first of all identify the cost. So first of all, we have to calculate the weighted average price per unit. So here number of units are given and the purchase cost per unit. So if I multiply, we will get some amount. If we multiply, we will get some amount. If we multiply, we will get some amount. And again here, if we multiply, we will get some amount. So we will get the total cost. And here we will get the total number of units. If we say the total number of units, that is 30, 30, 60 and 20, 80 number of units. And we will get here the total cost. Now we can see the solution. Total cost is 8640 and number of units is 80. 
total cost is 8640 and the number of units are 80. So we have to calculate cost per unit. So let's say cost per unit is 8640 divided by 80 units is 108. Now 108 is nothing but the cost per unit. 108 is nothing but the cost per unit whereas NRV is 107.75 per unit. So inventories are valued at lower of cost or NRV. So sir here NRV is lower than the cost. This is in terms of per unit only I calculated. If you want to go on a total basis, you can calculate. So 107.75 per unit is NRV and the cost is 108. Cost per unit is equal to 108. So 108 is nothing but the cost per unit whereas NRV is 107.75. Now we have to calculate how many number of units are there in our stock. Sir, we purchase 80 units and how many units issued? to the production or whatever it is. So, sir, it is uh, 40, 50, 60 units we have issued. So, how many units are there in our stock? So, 20 units in stock, in stock, 20 units. So, you can see your total cost, 108 per unit into 20 units, that is 2160, 2160. And here, they have calculated the NRV. That is 20 units into 107.75. That is nothing but 2155. So, NRV is 2155. Whereas, the cost is 2160. Lower of cost or NRV. So, we will value our inventory at 2155. That is nothing but NRV only. Very easy question. Okay. Let's see the C. Rohan Private Limited, a wholesaler in agriculture products. He is a wholesaler in agriculture products has valued the inventory on naturalizable value on the ground that AS2 does not apply to inventory of agriculture produce? The answer is no. See, AS2 does not apply to the producers of the agriculture products. Farmer, you can say. But he is a wholesaler in agriculture products. Obviously, he must have purchased agriculture products from, let us say, example, farmer then there will be something which is called as cost of acquisition of that particular agriculture product. So, I can say cost of acquiring that particular agriculture product, he must have paid something. So, he know the cost of that particular inventory and the NRV will be available in the market. So, he can go for valuation of inventory based on AS2. That is nothing but the lower of cost or NRV because he is a wholesaler. He is not a producer of ag agriculture products. If he is a producer of agriculture products, then for that producer of agriculture products, AS2 is not applicable because it is difficult or I can say it is not possible to ascertain the cost of inventory or I can say cost of that agriculture products because that person himself itself is a producer of agriculture products. So, same is mentioned here. You can read. Now, let us see question number 18, part A which is related to property, plant and equipment. Definitely here, above every question, they have mentioned that this question relates to which standard. But in exam, definitely it will not be mentioned. You have to read the question, you have to identify and then you have to write the answer. Now, A limited has incurred the following cost. Determine if the following cost can be added to the invoiced purchase price and included in the initial recognition of the cost of the item of property, plant and equipment. It means they are talking about AS10. They are talking about AS10. Here we have to understand the concept of capital expenditure, revenue expenditure. Capital expenditure capitalized in the cost of capital asset and revenue expenditure will be charged to PL. Unless and until this revenue expenditure is increasing the efficiency of the PPE above the original efficiency. Then in that case, that particular expenditure we should add, even though the asset is already installed. Okay, first, import duty state, definitely to get that particular asset in usable condition, I can say to get that asset to our factory premises, we have to pay the import duty because let us say example, we are purchasing from foreign country. So definitely this will be added. Next is nothing but the shipping cost and cost of road or transport for taking the machinery to the factory definitely to bring that particular factory in usable condition definitely we have to incur this expense next insurance for the shipping that is nothing but the transit insurance they are talking about transit insurance they are talking about definitely this will also get added next inauguration cost for the factory 
inauguration cost for the factory. So, sir, here asset or I can say this PPE will come in usable condition after that they are doing the inauguration of the factory. This expense is nothing to relate with the installation or I can say nothing to relate with the property plant and equipment. Let us say example machinery. So, this inauguration expense is in the nature of company formation expenses or I can say incorporation expenses kind of. So, this is nothing to relate with the asset or I can say this expense is incurred for inauguration of the factory not to bring the asset in their usable condition. So, this will be ignored. Professional fees charged by the consulting engineer for the installation. Definitely installation expenses will be added. Cost of advertising and promotional activities. This is purely your business branding cost. It is nothing to relate with installation of property plant and equipment or I can say this cost is not incurred to bring the asset in usable condition. No, you will ignore this. Administration and other general overhead cost ignored. Last is cost of site preparation. That is nothing but basically I can say preparing the foundation uh, on which we are supposed to install the machinery or I can say the plant. So, we have to prepare the foundation. So, cost of site preparation definitely it will be added in the cost of PPE. You can see the answer that 1, 2, 3 and 5 and 8 will be added. 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. Next. It is based on AS 11. Kumar Limited borrowed US dollar 3 lakh on 31st of December 2020, which will be repaid as on 30th June 2021. When we have borrowed, sir, we have borrowed on 31st of December 2020 and the repayment is going to happen on 30th June and definitely in between 31st March will come, their year ending will be 31st March. Then only the subsequent recognition concept will come. Kumar Limited prepares its financial statement ending on 31st March 2021. Rate of exchange between reporting currency and foreign currency on different dates are as under. So, the date on which the loan taken then year ending 31st March and the date on which the loan is repaid. Exchange rates are mentioned. Now, calculate borrowings in reporting currency to be recognized in the books on above mentioned dates and also show journal entries for the same. Now, listen carefully. First of all, there is something which is called as initial recognition, then subsequent recognition and then last is nothing but the settlement. Initial recognition is on, sir, 31st of December, 31st of December 2020. Then subsequent recognition that is nothing but on balance sheet date 31st of March 2021 and settlement is going to happen on 30th June, 30th of June 2021. Now here the rate on different dates, here the rate is $1 is equal to 44, here it is 44.5, $1 is equal to 44.5. And on settlement, the rate is 44.75. $1 is equal to 44.75. Now, here you can say we have taken the loan. We have borrowed. So, the date on which we have borrowed the loan, the rate was $1 is equal to 44. So, definitely we will recognize this loan in our books of accounts at 44. So, the loan amount was a $3 lakh. Dollar. That is nothing but dollar $3 lakh into 44 that will be the amount of initial recognition that will be the amount of initial recognition we will recognize this loan in our books of accounts at initial recognition at the rate of 44 you can see in the solution they have mentioned here bank account debit to foreign loan account that is nothing but 1 crore 32 lakhs how we got 1 crore 32 lakhs i'm just mentioning here the calculation that is nothing but the dollar 3 lakhs into dollar 3 lakhs into 44 that is nothing but bank account debit to foreign loan account now this foreign loan account listen carefully this foreign loan account is nothing but monetary item for me if you remember in as 11 for balance sheet items we used to classify the balance sheet items or against assets and liabilities into two categories monetary item and non-monetary item what do you mean by monetary item? Sir, monetary item means money held and assets and liabilities to be received or paid in fixed or determinable amount of money. 
So, sir, obviously, this foreign loan which we have to repay that is nothing but three lakh dollar only. That is nothing but fixed and determinable amount of money. So, definitely, this a foreign loan is considered as monetary item, and monetary items are supposed to be recognized at your end at closing rate. Because, boss, this is nothing but the closing rate. This is nothing but the closing rate. What do you mean by closing rate? So, the rate, rate on 31st March, or I can say the rate which is appearing, or I can say existing on your end, that is nothing but the closing rate. This 44, you can say it is nothing but the transaction date rate. What do you mean by this? Transaction date rate. The rate which was existed on the date of transaction. Transaction date rate. Okay. So now, this foreign currency loan. This foreign currency loan. Definitely, this is nothing but the short term loan only. This is nothing but short term loan only. We are not talking about foreign currency long term monetary item. We are not talking about foreign currency long term monetary item. That is para 46A. We are not talking about that here. We are just talking about short term loan. So here we are supposed to do the subsequent recognition. Subsequent recognition that is nothing but on balance sheet date. Balance sheet date we have to do the subsequent recognition at closing rate. Now dear students closing rate will be at 44.5. Now, here we have to identify whether there is a loss or a gain on subsequent recognition. Definitely, sir, initially we recognize our loan at 44. Now, we are supposed to recognize our loan at 44.5. Obviously, the loan amount will increase. That is nothing but dollar three lakh into 44.5. So, we are supposed to increase the loan amount. Definitely, sir, there is a loss. Loss of how much? So, sir, loss of dollar 3 lakh into 0.5 dollar 3 lakh into 0.5 that is nothing but 1.5 lakh worth of loss we have to book so sir on subsequent recognition we will recognize this loss of 1.5 lakh 1.5 lakh so definitely the loan amount will increase so we will credit our loan by 1 lakh 50 thousand so you can see in the solution we have credited this loan by 1 lakh 50 and this is nothing but the loss for us so we will debit foreign exchange difference account that is nothing but loss if you want to write the calculation in bracket you can just mention your dollar three lakh into point five now here there should be one more entry you can pass one more entry that is nothing but profit and loss account debit profit and loss account debit to foreign exchange difference account that is nothing but 1.5 lakh 1.5 lakh additional entry Next, now on 30th June, there is a settlement. Now, dear students, we re-recognize or I can say subsequently we have recognized this loan in our balance sheet as on 31st March 2021. Again, at what rate, sir? At 44.5. But now when we are going to settle this loan on 30th June 2021, then the settlement rate is 44.75. Can I say the exchange rate increase? Now, here, here, when we are supposed to pay or I can say when we when for paying this loan, the rate increase and now instead of 44.5, now we are supposed to pay this loan at the rate of 44.75. What do you mean by we have to pay more? It means definitely for this repaying loan, we need dollars. We will go in the bank or I can say authorize foreign exchange dealers. We will ask them, boss, please give us three lakh dollars. We have to pay the foreign currency or I can say foreign loan. Then they will say, okay. Today, the exchange rate is $1 is equal to rupees 44.75. Then, accordingly, we have to pay them rupees. So, we have to pay more. We have to pay more. How much we are supposed to pay more? So, definitely, sir, here again, the loss is $3 lakh into 0.25. The difference is 44.5 and 44.75. So, the difference is 0.25. That comes to 75,000. This 75,000 worth of loss we have to book on settlement date so you can see the solution now here we are paying so while paying dollar three lakh dollar three lakh into 44.75 at the rate of 44.75 we are paying now foreign loan account was appearing foreign loan account was appearing at 44.5 that is dollar three lakh into 44.5 Definitely, sir, foreign exchange difference, that is nothing but the loss, dollar three lakh into 0.25 that we have to book in our books of accounts on 30th June. Then definitely this loss will go to our p on 31st of March 2022, will transfer to or I can say will go to p 
for this entry is not required because by the time you reach to 31st March 2022, there will be many more transactions where the foreign exchange difference will come. So for this not necessary, you can just put a note that this will be transferred to TNL account and so on. Okay, now there is one more requirement part in the same question. Second part. If borrowings were repaid on 28th of February 2021 only, that is nothing but before 31st March, before 31st March. So, here definitely there will be nothing called as subsequent recognition. After initial recognition directly, there will be something which is called as settlement. So, if I want to write for the second requirement part, this was the first requirement part. Now, in case of second requirement part, sir, initial recognition and directly settlement will come. Initial recognition, sir, initial recognition on 31st of December 2020 at what rate, sir, $1 is equal to 44 only. Now, settlement is going to happen on 28th of February 2021. On that date, the rate is $1 is equal to rupees of 44.20, 44.20. Definitely, sir, here we will be booking a loss. On initial recognition, the loan will be recognized at dollar three lakh into 44. Dollar three lakh into forty four, and on settlement while paying, I have to pay these dollar three lakhs. So or I can say, when I'll be paying these dollar three lakhs, I have to purchase these dollars from the bank or authorized dealers. So I'll go to the bank or authorized dealers. They are asking me a price of forty four point two zero per dollar. So for purchasing these dollars, I have to give forty four point two rupees per dollar. So the total amount payable will comes to X amount. But sir, based on initial recognition, based on initial recognition, sir, there is a loss of how much? So, dollar 3 lakh into 0 0.20, that comes to 60,000 rupees. So, 60,000 worth of loss we will book. When? Sir, on settlement date. See, in the first example, from initial recognition to subsequent recognition, then subsequent recognition to settlement. In second one, initial recognition to directly settlement. The first part, in first part, exchange difference came twice. That is on subsequent recognition as well as on settlement. But in the second part, exchange difference came only once. That is nothing but directly at the time of settlement because after initial recognition, before year end comes, we settle that particular loan only. So, 60,000 worth of loss we have to book as a foreign exchange difference and definitely it will be transferred to PNL. Okay. So, you can see two bank. Here it is a dollar three lakh into. We are paying at the rate of forty four point two zero. The loan was recognized in our books of accounts at forty four per dollar, and the foreign exchange difference that is nothing but the dollar three lakh into point two zero. That is nothing but the loss of sixty thousand. They have mentioned the working note. That is nothing but the notes which I have mentioned here. In exam, you might be asking, sir, working notes are compulsory. If you are writing these numbers or I can say calculation in the bracket itself in the journal entry, then the below calculations or below notes are not required. I request you to please write narration also. Okay. Let us move to the next question. A very easy and interesting standard that is nothing but accounting for government grants. A fixed asset is purchased for 30 lakhs. Okay. Government grant received towards it is rupees 12 lakhs. It means can I say this with respect to monetary grant and this monetary grant we have received for purchase of fixed asset. Now this fixed asset is a depreciable fixed asset or non-depreciable fixed asset. Let us understand. Residual value is 6 lakhs and the useful life is 4 years. It means indirectly they are giving you the hint for calculation of depreciation. They are giving you hint for calculation of depreciation. It means this fixed asset is nothing but depreciable fixed asset. So, first of all, this is nothing but the monetary grant. This is nothing but the monetary grant. In monetary grant, this is with respect to purchase of purchase of fixed asset. In that purchase of fixed asset, this is related to depreciable fixed asset. Depreciable fixed asset. Now, if you remember, in monetary grant for purchase of fixed asset, which is related to depreciable fixed asset, there are two approaches for doing accounting. 
there are two approaches for doing accounting one is nothing but the capital approach another is nothing but the revenue approach sir what do you mean by capital approach simple capital approach is nothing but the approach where you deduct your government grant which you receive you deduct directly from the cost of the asset only that is we say as a capital approach revenue approach is nothing but the government grant which we are receiving we will treat that government grant as a deferred government grant and we will amortize over the period so here let us see what approach they are following so first of all we have identified the types of government grant that is monetary grant the purpose for purchase of fixed asset in that also for purchase of depreciable fixed asset the company charges depreciation based on slm okay asset is shown in the balance sheet net of grant oh very nice they have mentioned asset is shown in the balance sheet at net of grant net of grant means they are following which approach sir they are following capital approach what do you mean by capital approach sir capital approach capital approach means where the government grant will be deducted from the cost of the asset after one year grant becomes refundable to the extent of 7.5 lakhs okay here is a question where they are mentioning the amount of refund generally if you have referred the jksc textbook or i can say module questions if 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 the refund amount is not mentioned we consider that entire grant is refunded so here they have mentioned the refund amount that is nothing but 7.5 lakhs due to non compliance with certain conditions you are required to you are required to give necessary journal entries you are required to give necessary journal entries for second year so let us see the solution here after one year grant is become refundable and they are asking you the journal entry for the second year so it means they are asking you the entry for refund of grant and definitely the amount of revised depreciation definitely the amount of depreciation will change so let me do some working here only so the fixed asset is purchased for 30 lakhs so we purchase for 30 lakhs now here it is capital approach it means the amount of government grant which we are receiving that we will directly deduct from the cost of the asset only the amount of grant is how much sir amount of grant is nothing but 12 lakhs so we will deduct 12 lakhs from here only so the book value after receipt of government grant that is nothing but 18 lakhs now we are supposed to depreciate this so first of all we have to calculate depreciation per annum depreciation per annum so depreciation per annum is nothing but 18 lakhs minus scrap value is how much so i can say the estimated residual value is nothing but 6 lakhs divided by useful life is 4 years so let me calculate that is nothing but 18 minus 6 12 12 divided by 4 that is nothing but 3 lakh per annum so 3 lakh per annum so let us start depreciation for one year this is nothing but the depreciation for year one so after charging depreciation the balance is your 15 lakhs okay this 15 lakhs is nothing but net book value of the asset after one year before refund of grant now let us go for refund of grant that is nothing but 7.5 lakhs worth of grant is getting refunded so at the time of at the time of receipt of grant we directly deducted this amount of grant from the cost of the asset now in the same way we will add back this government grant which we are refunding we will add back this in the amount of asset that is nothing but the fixed asset so we will add here that is nothing but 7.5 lakh total comes to 22.5 lakh this is nothing but this is nothing but the net book value net book value after refund of grant that is nothing but after one year when we refunded the grant after refund this is nothing but the net book value now we are supposed to calculate revised depreciation revised depreciation revised depreciation per annum is equal to so 22 22.5 lakh minus estimated scrap value divided by estimated useful life so remaining useful life is nothing but three years only so 22.5 minus 6 divided by 3 it comes to 5.5 lakh per annum for remaining three years so 5.5 lakh is nothing but depreciation for year two so what will be the journal entry so first of all sir we are supposed to pass journal entry for the second year only in the second year first of all we will pass entry for refund of grant so when we receive the grant we pass the entry bank account debit to fixed asset because we directly credited in the cost of the fixed asset only now we will reverse the entry that is fixed asset account debit to bank so you can see the journal entry here fixed asset account debit to bank in the second year that is 7.5 7.5 now we are supposed to charge the revised depreciation as we already calculated revised depreciation 5.5 lakh per annum 
So the entry for depreciation is depreciation account debit to fixed asset and the same depreciation will be transferring to PNL, PNL account debit to depreciation. That's it. The same working which I did is mentioned here. Now, let us go for the next question. AS13 accounting for investment. AS13 accounting for investment. Now in AS13, you know there are two types of investment. First is nothing but the current investment. Second is nothing but the non-current. Current means short term investment and non-current means long term investment. Short term investments are valued at lower of cost or market value and any change in the value will be transferred to PNL. Reckon so whether there is a profit or loss, then definitely it will be transferred to your PNL. Now, long term investments will be valued at long term investment will be valued at cost only unless and until there is a permanent diminution. Unless and until there is permanent diminution. Okay, let us see the question. JVR Limited has made investment of 97.84 crores in equity shares of QSR Limited. QSR Limited in the year 2016-17. The investment has been made at par. Okay. QSR Limited has been in continuous losses for last two years. It means we are holding this investment since last two years. So definitely this will be considered as a long term because the, here the intention is to hold this investment for longer period. Longer period means sir, period of more than 12 months. So we will consider this as a long term. And here they are saying uh, this QSR Limited has been in continuous loss. Has been in continuous losses for the last two years. So here we can consider this as a permanent reduction in the value of investment. Let us read ahead. JVR Limited is willing to reassess the carrying amount of the investment in QSR Limited and wish to provide for diminution in the value of investment for the year ended 31st March 2021. Yes, they can provide. Discuss whether the connection of JVR Limited to bring down. I think so it should be contention of JVR Limited to bring down the carrying amount of investment in QSR Limited is in accordance with accounting standards. So here, first of all, you have to mention with respect to there are two types of investment, current or a non-current. So you can see here, first we are talking about current. Current investments and long-term investment. A current investment is an investment that by its nature, readily realizable and intended to be held for not more than one year from the date on which such investment is made. Now they are saying how to value. Carrying amount for current investment is the lower of cost and fair value. Any reduction to fair value and any reversal of such reductions are included in the statement of PNL. Now they are talking about long term. So long term, as already I mentioned, it should be valued at cost only unless and until there is a permanent reduction. And if there is a permanent reversal, then definitely you can reverse the situation. So in this question, looking at the investment tenure, or I can say their intention here, it is to be considered as long term investment and Looking at the situation of the company only, that is nothing but the QSR Limited has been in continuous losses for last two years. So definitely this can be considered as permanent diminution and we can reassess the carrying amount of long term investment. Okay. At what value we are supposed to record that is not mentioned or I can say how much loss we are supposed to book that they are not asking. They are just asking whether we can go for reassessment of the carrying amount or not. Now, let us see the last question. That is question number 20 because this is nothing but the last standard of AS uh, with respect to paper 1. That is nothing but your accounting. Question number 20. An enterprise has constructed a complex piece of equipment. Oh, they are saying it is a qualifying asset. Sorted. What do you mean by qualifying asset? Sir, qualifying asset means that asset which necessarily takes substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or a sale. I am repeating once again, qualifying asset means that asset which necessarily takes substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or a sale. So qualifying asset that is to be installed on the production line of a manufacturing plant. Okay. The equipment has been constructed over a period of 15 months. Definitely if it is a qualifying asset, it will necessarily take substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or a sale. However, on installation, Certain calibrations are required to achieve the desired level of production before it's finally commissioned. This process is expected to take approximately two months during which test runs will be made. Definitely, after installing, we cannot directly stop capitalizing the borrowing costs. First of all, that asset should come in a situation where we can start with the commercial production. 
it means it is ready for commercial production that will be definitely after test run so once the test run is done after that we can say now this particular item or i can say this qualifying asset is ready for commercial production and then we should stop capitalizing the borrowing cost because if it is a qualifying asset then definitely we can capitalize the borrowing cost in the cost of this asset till when so till that particular asset is coming in a usable condition where we can go for commercial production so even though there's a period of test run where they are saying that for two months during which test run will be made so for that particular two months also we can capitalize we can capitalize the borrowing cost in the cost of qualifying asset should the borrowing cost attributable to the borrowings pertaining to the two months test run period be capitalized yes already i explained and the last is should capitalization of borrowing cost be continued when the qualifying asset has been constructed but marketing activities to sell the asset are still in progress so that is nothing but the selling and distribution activity but definitely the asset is already constructed in usable condition where we can start with commercial production if we can start with the commercial production with that particular qualifying asset then we should stop we should stop capitalizing the borrowing cost even though the marketing activities are yet to commence but the particular qualifying asset in a situation where we can start with the commercial production we should stop capitalizing the borrowing cost so this was rtp with respect to group 1 paper 1 that is accounting only accounting standards thank you so much